Hello, a very warm welcome once again to the Change Exchange. My guest is someone who is as at home in front of the camera as I may be, Graeme Richards, espresso anchor at the moment, one of, and MC, voice artist, actor, what else? Entrepreneur? Uh, well, first of all, very excited at the moment, just hearing your <laughs> voice um, say my name is, is quite a treat. So, really Are you another one who's going to say, I grew up with you? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> I, my friends call me former child star because I started so, so young. So I think we, we probably went through a lot of the same gateways <laughs> together. But I, if anything, I'm probably just professionally myself. I think I've, I'm blessed to have a career that I'm yet to define what it is that I actually do, but I, I, I get to be myself every day and do these wonderful things. But, so um, many people would give their left uh, arm for that. Completely. You started as at a boarding school yeah. in KwaZulu-Natal, and it wasn't one of the smart ones. <laughs> it was a lesser known one who meant a lot in your life, um, which meant? Very much so. I think, you know, I think past alumni from, from Treverton and teachers would be, be a bit um, upset about it being a lesser known school, but it's, I think where a lot of the, Sorry. That, that elitist nature that is so often associated to the, the KZN schools, that certainly didn't exist there. It was very wildlife orientated, very outdoor orientated. I know people often ask me if I studied animal husbandry and such. It wasn't an agricultural school, um, <laughs> but it, it did have a farm and it meant riding horses every weekend and I was a, a little city delinquent. I was terrified of everything when I went there. I think I was quite a handful for my, my poor mom who was, is the most amazing person and I think she really felt the need to, to give me some structure, give me some positive male influence in my life. And I remember taking, she took me to this, this trade fair where the school was, they had a climbing wall and there were these guys shimmying up and down like Spider-Man. She said, does this look like a school that you'd like to go to? And I was like, oh yeah. And she said, well, you've got to maintain an 85% average and you can get a scholarship and then you can go. Treverton. Um, Treverton. In Moy River. In Moy yeah. Oh. Um, tiny little town. And at the time that I was there, there was a huge amount of political unrest as well in that area. It was a real hotbed. So. Mm. Unbeknownst, whether it was subconsciously or consciously, I was getting a real lesson in where South Africa was as well. Um, but it absolutely shaped me. I'm, I'm so blessed to have gone there. But your first time on stage was also in Muerafir <laughs> as Tom Sawyer. That's, that, was def that was my first award-winning performance. <laughs> um, but I, I was so lucky. Mrs. Lanham, and I still remember your name, Mrs. Lanham, um, she, she was our drama teacher, but we used to put on these productions where p parents would come from all over the country, literally, to come and watch this, this production at the, the Muerafir Town Hall. And it's, um, it really did plant that seed, so I was so lucky. To, to have that influence that early on. And I think once the bug bit, I, mm. I just jumped on that. You know? Well, you started doing television pre presentation um, while you were still at school. Yeah. And did you just, how did you relate to the camera? Did it just feel natural, feel easy? You know, I, often, I, I wonder about it now, because I think you, maybe you've gone through this gateway, every time you kind of disconnect from from the camera and it takes a while to get that fitness back and that, mm. that connection. But I, I think I've always made a, a strong connection with people and for me, that's what a camera is. I think as soon as you look beyond it being, it's not a million people sitting in an auditorium, it's, it's one person sitting in their lounge, maybe in their underpants, yeah. you know, you just don't, it's a very personal space. And I think once you understand that it's not about you and it's about that, um, and then of course you get this unbelievable validation and these, yes, you get the negative feedback as well, but that, that feeling of, of being able to connect, of being able to be a part of much bigger stories and meet these amazing people and sportsmen, <laughs> especially being a bit of a sportsman at that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, I, you know, you can tell by the amount I talk, I was always destined to go in that direction. But, uh, but you, you worked as a, I found it um, quite interesting, <laughs> you worked as a continuity presenter, which means you had to read scripts that other people wrote, <laughs> and then promptly went off and became a scriptwriter. Yeah. Was that a comment on the quality of the scripts? Oh, you know, this, and I, <laughs> I, I say this with all due respect, I, I was so lucky to have my career born within the SABC at a time where there were massive holes within very key structures. And I have this thing that I just don't say no. So as soon as someone said, well, can you write? I'm like, yeah, no, no, I can write. Can you use a camera? Yeah, no, of course I can, I can use it. <laughs> Knowing that I had a friend, someone I could phone to say, listen, how do you turn it on and, and how do you focus and what do you do? And I worked under a gentleman by the name of Keith Pfeiffer when I was working for, for SABC One. 
and he used to produce them as South Africa's and um, had really big ideas and amazing kind of lost children campaigns and all these things he wanted to do. And I think he was a kindred spirit and really took me under his wing. And I just remember that when I wrote the, the script for, for the first Miss South Africa that I presented when I was 19 years old, walking into this room with the Ken Kirstens and the, you know, the people at the peak of their career, it was Sun City Super Bowl, when and a rebirth of that, I was thinking, oh my God, uh, mm. I'm a child. And I think they kind of treated me as such, but it's, I, I love to write. Um, I won't say I'm the best writer, but I love being able to express myself like that. So did you write your own, did they allow you to write your own script? They paid me to write my own script and I think I... Amazing, doll. I, I monopolized, you know, SABC Sport, I, which was then called Mubbling, because as soon as I, I found a, a hole or an inadequacy, and again, I had a Melinda, uh, Melinda Lombard, who was a brilliant producer, who was taking us out into the locations every weekend and doing amazing stuff, but there were so many holes in the production model that required people to do more mm. and adapt and, and grow their skills. So I just... I started writing for this and voicing for that and presenting over there. And I think at one point I was probably working on about eight different productions within the SABC, just climbing that ladder of inadequacy wherever I went. And as soon as I saw a hole, I would just I would um, kind of fill that that gap. Did you ever consider getting formal education? I mean, tertiary education. Many, many times. <laughs> I think having been blessed and cursed with the attention span of a, of a three-year-old, I just... A I'll, Labrador puppy. I'll study when I'm about 60, <laughs> when I rediscover my youth, and maybe I'll do some philosophy or, or something along those lines. But I, I found in our job, I, you're always being thrown in the deep end. You're always being pushed so far beyond what you know, and generally alongside someone who has gravitas, someone who has, you, you can't hope to match a judge advocate on his knowledge base. So you start to learn the tricks of the trade, and you could probably lecture me for hours on this, but that, 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 that human space, that authentic, mm -hmm. and that's something that I really do enjoy. So I think for me, the honing of the skills has been very much about rising to the challenge in the moment, less than being prepared to mm -hmm. make myself feel more comfortable or less nervous and those sorts of things. I love that feeling of when everyone else is losing their mind and my earpiece is literally shaking in, in my <laughs> ear because my director's having a fit out of fear, that's suddenly when I find my calm center mm. in the storm. So um, but I, would, did, I would love to study. Mm. How did you experience morning television? You started, when was it, 2008 with ETV? With ETV, that was wonderful. Um, working under Nicholas Mapopo, an old friend who had also moved across from the SABC, and Cindy Mabe, who was like a, a kindred. So we couldn't have been more different, the most odd couple on TV, but we just had this instant connection. And that, I mean, being untrained, stepping into a room where everyone had a, a journalism degree or such and that this massive news system worth hundreds of millions that have been modeled on this very American model and I mean it was wonderful I could if I spoke about something they would just bring it up there would be visuals because the system had it and I it became a bit of a megalomaniac I think in that space it was just it was so far beyond anything I'd experienced before and it was going into 2010 it was the World Cup I was sitting at a table next to Seth Blatter I was there right in the mix so that was was absolutely phenomenal but not being a morning person and still not being a morning person my creativity kicks in at about 11 o'clock at night it's it's difficult and i still battle and and thankfully i'm surrounded by very forgiving people who know my buttons and how many cups of coffee i need to be brought at <laughs> what time henny i love you i love you henny um, he's our chief technician who still takes the time to bring me coffee yeah. every 20 minutes but You've um, said that Espresso is, is very special because mm. it sets out to motivate and inspire. Is that an e completely. expressed um, <laughs> um, motto? Um, well, it is. It's, it's the feel good. And I think, you know, it took me a while. I was so jaded with South African TV when I moved to, to Cape Town. I thought, I'm just going to act and climb the mountain and grow a beard, <laughs> proper beard. Um, and I was, I, I, when I, after I'd left ETV, I, I really thought, okay, well, the presenting days are behind me. I need to kind of follow that deep dream of being an actor and uh, like so many of our jobs do it just happened completely coincidentally that I bumped into an executive producer who knew someone else who knew Patient Stevens who kind of and I remember having my first meeting with Patience and just basically we spoke about sport for about two hours and we really got each other enthused and, and I could feel her passion and that was a, a good indication of that this might be an opportunity to do it mm -hmm. slightly differently and be 
authentic and as much as I'd always been striving to do, because I'm not polished and I, I talk too much and my hands are in the air and I'm, I'm, if you had to write a rule book of what a presenter should do, I probably wouldn't tick 90% of those, those boxes, but for me it, it really is about that authenticity and that was mm -hmm. the only way I was going to ever get back onto TV was if I could really be authentic and find that, that place. And now I'm on this, this, this ridiculous platform, the Mickey Mouse Club for Grown Ups or something <laughs> where we sing and dance and cook, and, but I'm surrounded by the most amazing people. Mm -hmm. And I have a, you know, you've interviewed Kat a number of times, Alana, you know, um, Zoe Liang, you and they've become a, a family. We've all connected and I think Cape Town has this way of, because people come, it's such an eclectic mix of people here that mm -hmm. you're forced to make connections and bonds. And I feel like, you know, when people say Cape Town's clicky, and I've couldn't disagree more. For me, it feels like I've, I've been forced to make new friends and forced to make mm. even deeper connections here. And now I've got this show where every morning I get to have a positive influence on people's lives. And that, mm. I mean, in the world that we live in at the moment, it's, it, yes, it's easy to point out mistakes. It's easy to point out what's going wrong. It's, it's, there are soap boxes everywhere. Um, and we, yes, we do need to get up there and, and shout our message, but the bottom line is what we all desperately need is to choose to be positive. And we give people ways of being able to do that. And that's, mm. oh, that's remarkable. Tell me a little bit more about the decision to leave Johannesburg. What were you <sighs> reacting against? What were you choosing for? Uh, yeah, I think I was a bit of a mess at the time. And it, there were a couple of things that kind of all, uh, as life often does, kind of forces these gateways on you rather That's than you having That's about 10 a, years ago. It feels like yesterday, but it, 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 it really must be. It, it's, it's probably about eight years now. And that I, I, in my personal life, we were a branch. I convinced my best mates to start a company with me. We were punching so far above our weight class, doing amazing work. Had three massive clients closed down in the space of about a month when the, the in real, what field were you? Um, in video production online media which was oh. unheard of at that stage and we were forcing people to set up these online media production hubs and doing the most amazing stuff and and i was busy explaining to people what bandwidth meant <laughs> um, that was where the market was and if you think of how primed it is at the moment how that that digital divide has just um, been completely obliterated um, so we were doing groundbreaking, amazing stuff, and but we learned some massive lessons. And I'm sorry, and so, you know, you hear the cliches about having to to go through the fire in business and fail three times before you really know what works. And it's not necessarily that simple, but you've got to go through certain gateways or, or face certain challenges. But we had everything stripped away from us. <laughs> everything and I mean you know selling cars pawning everything you owned tasting a, a, a level of hopelessness that was just beyond anything that I had experienced and, and gave me huge empathy and, and a well of strength that I, I never knew that I possessed and around that time when I thought I'd hit rock bottom I, I'd been through a couple of horrible experiences crime wise and but nothing that I felt like I couldn't handle or you know well, not that I deserved but they just felt like I was there for a reason and then something happened to my my ex-girlfriend and that I just couldn't let go mm. of I couldn't move beyond it um, and neither could she and she fought and saved herself which I think was an amazing thing and empowering for her but it just broke me and I I think I felt there was a part of me that that was feeling so violent and that's not a happy resting place to have that that kind of thought though those violent thoughts almost homicidal fantasies where I would just see someone imagine them doing something and want to wring their neck and it was just mm. such an unhealthy space to be in and I know there are a lot of South Africans a lot of people across the globe who have experienced violence on some level and and I'm lucky that I've been able to process it I've got an amazing mm. family of um, how does one get beyond that I, I mean, just moving you, doesn't you, do it. Yeah, you forget about yourself. I think that's the thing. I've, I've, whenever I've had negative kind of influences or negative repercussions in my life, it's generally because I've become too self-orientated. And then you move out of that space and you start thinking deeply about other people and doing bigger things and more meaningful things uh, for other make people. It, make it practical? Um, yeah, very much so. I mean, I came down here and I climbed the mountain for probably about three weeks. And when I say climbed, I mean, I climbed and I... I through the beard and I, I turned into this mountain man freak that um, I, I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to kind of connect again with society. It just Did your relationship it, also break up at the same time? It did and sure. I think not necessarily mm. just a direct result of that but it was certainly mm. part of that and, um, and she's gone on to, to do amazing things and she needed to, to obviously um, move through that herself and I'm, I'm really proud of the way that she, the funny thing is that night that she got attacked we had been 
watching, and you mentioned boarding school, we have been watching an, an EFC tournament, and then I started explaining to her how you defend yourself when you're being attacked by a much bigger guy at boarding school, because I was tiny. I was, my best mate was Shorty, and he was about an inch taller than me, and he was just so named because he was there a year before me, so he got the nickname um, before me, and I just, it was, I, I just remember always having to defend myself at boarding school, you're always fighting back then, it was a very physical, and you know, that's the way that you, you survived those things. So. Um, I think that, that, I don't want to say that poor attacker, but he, I think this is the first time in his life, and he actually got caught two weeks after that because he changed his modus operandi because he had never had someone fight back. And she fought for her life and she defended herself, and that was something that was truly amazing to me and I think allowed both of us to, to move beyond that. But um, Okay, but now I want to take you back to now you're on Table Mountain for three mm -hmm. weeks, and then? I think a lot of that was not so much wanting to put my life at risk and I, and I was doing crazy things and, and I mean free climbing sections of the mountain that I've since gone back to and tried to climb and I love it, I spend a lot of time on the mountain but I've, I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't out of a sense of letting go or wanting to die or give up on my family. And I, I have such Almost a, a kind of long term hysteria. Yeah, it, it really was. I think there was just such a disconnect and I'd, I'd really lost my way in many respects but I'd also, I, I needed to to really prove to myself how much I did want to be alive and how much I did want to embrace the good things in my life. And, and I was unfulfilled. I felt like I kept getting so close to doing these amazing things, whether it was in TV, whether it was as in entrepreneurship or in, in philanthropy, I was doing these amazing things, but never quite taking it to the place that I, I wanted to. And that's... Um, and then? I think there was a day where I, I woke up and I was staying in my mother's flat at that stage and she had gone up to Johannesburg. I think in a, probably it was a bit of an intervention, I think. I think she was just, had isolated me in Cape Town and said, like, just do your thing and, you know, when you're right, connect with us again. And I remember waking up in, in her bed and looking up on the wall and she had a photo wall of our whole family's history, literally. And, and a, the chief male influence in my life was my grandfather, um, who sadly passed away when I was quite young, but very, very old school gentleman, beautiful man who did amazing things during the time of apartheid was, was certainly stood out as a South African, an exemplary example of what, what South Africans could have been at that time. So I was so lucky to have that as the example. And there was a, one particular photo of him, obviously fresh out of, of um, World War II, and that I just couldn't look at that, that picture without feeling shame at, at, at not just getting up and doing something. It just, it, it's bizarre, but um, mm. there was definitely a, a, a moment there. And I just remember getting out of, out of bed, putting some shoes on, going for this run. I literally ran around Cape Town, probably about 50 Ks or something, and just worked through things, worked through things. And just having that shift the next week, bumped into the right person at the right time, and everything just unfolded. And I've, I've been so lucky, I feel like I, I have Was that when to... you got uh, the expressive job? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, mm. it was unplanned. I mean, I'd, as I said, I was almost not wanting to get back into TV, and it took quite a push to actually to do that. Um, but you also yeah. said that um, philanthropy played a huge role, and when you've been in a dark place, you've almost used that. I, I think, and, it, and I, I won't say consciously, it's just, it yes. seems to be the pattern that, yeah. that's emerged. And I think, if, you know, fast forward, like, or rewind maybe a decade before that dark period, when I was about 19, 20, again, with a group of mates, um, a, a, an amazing man, Pepsi Pocani, who now still does a lot of producing, and um, we were actually at school together, and we had moved in together, we had started a little company together, we're doing things, and again, we, we had done a, a, an event around um, Stop Child Abuse, a particular organization that was working where one of our, our big sponsors was an alcohol brand, and everything had been a huge success, and then I got a phone call on a Monday morning from the managing director of that particular brand saying, listen, you know, we can't be associated with anything related to child abuse or domestic abuse. We're an alcohol brand and, and it's just not allowed. And I think I was about 21 at that stage and then I was like, okay, so we're not going to get the 50,000 Rand that was put for that. And that 50,000 Rand became about 200,000 Rand. Mm -hmm. And then it's, and I had mates who were at first year of varsity and, and mm -hmm. youngsters coming, drawing their daily limit of 300 Rand and giving it to me. And it was a crazy time, but for some reason I'd met, there was a youngster named uh, Moretti Tsotsetsi who, was I didn't realize that when he first met me, he was a, a street kid. He had taken himself out of a location in Harry Smith when he was 10 years old, lived in town his whole life, kept himself in school, had helped his little brother do the same, was on and off the, the street, staying at a ridiculous place called Paradise City that thankfully has since been closed down, that was just an abusive, terrible place. And um, he came to me one day 
saying that he, um, he was just embarrassed. He needed to wash his clothes because he's starting to smell and he wants to go back to school. I thought, okay, well, um, okay, I can, I can do that for you. And then what happens after that? Then he's going to go back and sleep mm. on the street and you become a mate. He used to bring me his report cards and things <laughs> like that. And it was, it was this like weird kind of big brother type relationship. And I thought, okay, well, do something. Okay, well, you can crash here tonight. Um, and I remember going to, all I could afford that night was, and this is while still doing presenting jobs, being on TV, having to present this guise of being successful and living the top billing life and that sort of thing. And, um, and all I could afford was a pack of two minute noodles and a, a roll that we shared. And he was looking at me, I just, he couldn't compute that this white mm. guy on TV was in such a, a hectic situation. And I remember asking him like, how are you doing? Are you, how are you feeling? And he didn't understand what I was asking him. He had never in his life had an emotional conversation. No one had ever stopped and said, listen, are you okay? Like, not just, you know, fine, how are you, but are you really okay? Mm -hmm. But no, no, this is ridiculous. If I've been able to save myself through these situations and hustle, let's hustle. Started phoning, phoning, and within an hour, I turned his life around. I got him into Twilight Children, and in order to pay them back, I had helped Twilight Children get a, mm. a Stuart Kinnickor sponsorship and just started applying all of the things that I knew in the industry. And then that just evolved into a three-year campaign of Mertie and I just looking for sponsorship, being on news programs. And when, when the hard sell wasn't working, I'd bring in the street child, say no to him, <laughs> just say no to him and see, yeah, see how that goes. Um, and mm. that's... I mean, apart from giving me some amazing skills and unbelievable moments, and I mean, to, to say that from starting out on the street, Moeti and his younger brother, his younger brother is now just qualified as a lawyer from UJ. So, and certainly and not by it's my... It? And Moeti? And um, Sadly, we've lost touch, and it's something that breaks my heart, and, and I, I really hope you see this somewhere out there, but I think he always saw himself as being too far gone, and just didn't, I don't think he thought that he could find his way back to society mm. and often we'd have to go and identify with kids that we were trying to get into Twilight where he would look them in the eye and say, okay, yeah, can we say, no, it's too late. And as heartbreaking as that is, I understood in retrospect looking at the kids that did fall out of the system, the ones that mm. we'd get into Greenside High for two years and they just wouldn't be able to, to change, to mm. adopt the, the rules. And when you think if you've been free, but completely free your whole life, and now to have to try and fit into a, a box like that was impossible. But I just, when I look back, I'm, I am very proud that I, I kind of, even as a young guy, mm -hmm. was doing these things that, and not as an organization, or as a, just as a, a human being, but I, I feel so lucky to have experienced these things that when I talk to the majority of the people that live in my world, they just have no ink. Yes, Graham, but it's, uh, that's so far removed from the image. Oh, okay. And I think of, if, if you Google Graham Richards, what you find <laughs> is Strictly Come Dancing, of yeah. course. <laughs> so, what happened there? How did you get involved? Oh, my word. And, and uh, again, I'll Why say, did you say yes? Did you not realize I'm, what I, it was going yeah, to be? I told be? you, I have a rule that I say yes to everything. And the funny thing is, I thought like years before that someone had said, oh, you should do Strictly. And I was like, no, buddy, <laughs> I should really not do Strictly. Um, but it was, Why? It just, Don't I, you think you have... I have no Do you have rhythm, brother? I was devoid <laughs> of musicality. Um, love to dance, love to sing, can't do either, or at least couldn't. Um, and I've always been surrounded by these musical savants, and it's no different at Expresso with the likes of Catherine mm. at the moment. But I, I just kind of always knew somehow, and this is going to sound completely bizarre, but I had this vision of meeting the person, one, doing strict... And this was after it had been cancelled. I'd gone to support Emmanuel Custis, a mate of mine, years before, a fantastic actor, eventually won with Lindsay, my current girlfriend. Um, and I didn't even meet her then. Had no connection to her whatsoever. We'd but you had been, this dream. But I that... had this, this image. Yeah. And I remember saying to, um, I think it was a, a, a judge or someone at a particular dance production who was saying, oh, you should do Strictly. I was like, just wait. I have a feeling that something's going to come. And true as Bob, two years later, it came back on the fold and they asked if I'd like to do it. And um, with it being on SABC3 and me being on Expresso, there was an opportunity to do that. And I thought, well, just try and see. Um, but I did phone my agent and say, listen, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but please make sure that my partner's not married because <laughs> I just have a feeling about this, this situation. And, and, and when was, you saw her the first time, was there... Instant connection. Yeah, you know, shame. Um, 
I think she was a little terrified. You know, I do come with a lot of energy and a lot of, and I'd never stop talking, as you, as you well know now. Um, and yeah, I think she enjoyed the fact that I was fit and, and she could just train me for kind of seven to fifteen hours a day, um, and I loved it. I mean, and when did you know that this relationship could actually last? Um, do you ever really know these things? I, I'm always kind of all in. That's just the, my, my personality type. And I'd been single for quite a while before um, doing that. I'd been down in Cape Town for about two years. Um, but about two weeks in, do you know what it was? It was the rumba. It's, it was the Bruno Mars and the rumba and being this close to a person for seven hours a day. Um, but How we, could you not? <laughs> you know, we just we, we developed a, a depth of connection so quickly that it just was impossible, undeniable to both of us. And she achieved miracles with me. Um, it was just difficult when coming back into the real world for me yes. to become the boss in our relationship <laughs> after she had kind of set the boundaries and the rules for our first, first three oh, months. Oh, are you now her boss? Uh, well, uh, at least to, to have some say in the matter. <laughs> um, and it's, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I think one of her biggest lessons teaching me was that the male always leads and you've got to do so with respect. And we, I mean, we do a huge amount of work with young dancers now, especially young men, to teach them that, that, that grounding of, that, of chivalry and what it is to be a gentleman and how to be a strong man. Um, and the arts gives you, gives you so much opportunity to do that. Um, it is now three and a half years later, and yeah. it's not every, not glamorous every day. <laughs> so, how do you keep all. the relationship fit? Um, and <laughs> you know, we, we work really hard at it. So I think, mm. like like everyone who, who's had a successful, and we've we've gone through really tough times. We've had to redefine who we are as people. I've been able to help her move out of the, that competitive dance phase. I mean, she's a four-time British champion she's one of the best dancers in the world and now having to move into a space where she can commercialize that skill and start adapting it to the south african market she's from the uk um, so have you started dance school um she teaches we've she put on uh, productions we've i mean we've done amazing things together we put on a, the most awesome dance production i think purely just to both be on a stage together and dance again where we, mm -hmm. we had kids from from some amazing dance schools in Delft and areas like that that are just that seem hopeless on the outside yet you find these kind of these upspringing mm -hmm. these these wells of, of creativity in that and um, she she loves to teach I think that is, is definitely one of her, her and how has it changed you to be part of a couple not just a dancing couple but a, a real and emotional practical couple um, it's 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 a different it's a different space. Yeah, very yeah. much so. And I think for what what really has defined our relationship is is just that it's the, the partnership element. Mm. Um, and we're both very strong and very fiery. And I come from a family of very strong women. And I think it took her a while to get used to the conflict model where nothing festers. You sort it out. You deal with it. And it's out there, and you you do it. Um, and she's now certainly embraced that. Um, and that, again, has been a learning curve now with, with having to adjust for this next phase of life that we, we're entering into. It's, um, we, we learn every day, but it's, it's amazing to have a partner that really does, sees it as that, a partnership, and mm. is, is willing to work as... as Stands partner. shoulder to shoulder with uh, you. Oh, mm. probably, probably head and shoulders above, but um, no, and she, how she's do you, lovely and she's, she's strong, which is amazing. How do you feel about the prospect of being a father? I, How far along is are you? It's tomorrow, basically. It feels like a really? little man is coming. <laughs> um, the the twenty seventh of April is the due date, oh. um, and I I cannot wait. I've I grew up without a father and had a mother that was very much a father figure and a mother figure and everything else and and did a, such an amazing job. So I've got I really have a lot of pressure to follow on that that path of being an aware, an emotional, spiritual person. I want to be that for, for him, but there is something really cool about, about knowing that it's a boy coming into the world and that I get to continue this amazing bloodline because there were some amazing men in my family and, and my father, as much as I, I didn't get to know him, I know that there were parts of him that, that were really amazing that he would have, um, mm. that, that do deserve to be, to be passed on. And that's, so um, what's the ideal father in your head? I don't know. I think maybe it's the ideal human. It's it's letting go mm -hmm. of enough of your own baggage so that it doesn't influence. I think my my biggest and maybe you can offer me some advice here is I feel like everything that's had a positive influence on me in terms of my character, it's been the worst stuff that's happened to me. So how do you impart those skills? How do you teach your son to be strong, to be empathetic, to be a, a compassionate person, to to deal with pressure? 
without having to go through those those terrible things. And I think a big part of that is going to have to be me letting go of the need to to control that space. And I'm sure if he's anything like me or his mother, he's going to be a crazy little um, you know, face in the wind kind of guy. Um, or he's going to be a complete academic and rolling his eyes at the two of us for the rest <laughs> of his life. Like, oh my God, please excuse my parents. I'm so sorry. Um, but I can't wait. I've, you've never heard a cheer because we first thought it was going to be a girl. And I would have loved to have had a girl. I, I thought I'm, uh, somewhere in the back of my mind, having grown up in a female household, I thought three daughters, definitely. That's going to be my, my karma. Um, but when the second scan um, came through and, and you've never heard such a cheer to a little scrotum ever. <laughs> <laughs> the, even the doctor, she she jumped on board, and uh, just it's it's lovely. I'm I'm so excited, and of course, being a sporty guy, I can mm. I've mapped out the next like 15 years of everything we're going to do together. And tell me something about the the home, the physical home. That what is your house like? The funny thing is, I've literally just today signed my lease for my new flat. Um, sea Point and, and Cape Town living is, you know, it's not like Joburg where you've got your, your, your big expanse of homes and with me needing to be close to Sea Point and, and working the kind of hours that I do and needing to stay connected mm. to Lindsay, we've got to kind of stay in this, in this bubble and not planning to, to obviously have the child has meant a, a complete turnaround. Um, so we've now finally found a beautiful flat with a beautiful space around it right next to the promenade. That just, mm. it, it's free, it's light, it, it has everything that we've been looking for under duress because I needed to do something now. And I think for Lindsay, the, the nest, I don't know if that's the official term, the nesting you know, instinct has kicked in big time. So she's been desperate to, to feel settled and, and me as well. So it's, it's quite auspicious that we've, we've actually connected today because that I literally drove from the estate agent here. So I now thankfully have my new home for the next two years that I think is gonna, it's gonna make us very happy. May you be enormously happy. Thank and you so much. thank you for this conversation. Thank you so, so much. It's been a, an absolute pleasure meeting you properly. <laughs> Until next time, goodbye.